No matter the religious affiliation, these recent archaeological discoveries that may share ties to biblical prophecies can be appreciated either through a religious lens or through a more secular historical approach. Regardless of what religious entity you identify with, if any, these are fascinating discoveries nonetheless. So today, we'll be taking a look into three recent biblical discoveries and the stories they tell. Galilee Jesus Boat In 1986, two brothers, Moshe and Yuval Lufan, made an interesting and equally unsuspecting discovery. The brothers were residents of Kibbutz Genesar, a region in Israel in sheer proximity of the Sea of Galilee. Contrary to the body of water's name as what it might suggest with the title sea, it is fresh water in nature and in actuality a lake, not a sea. The lake is not particularly deep and happens to rank second after the infamous Dead Sea located in Jordan. In 1986, as the tides had lowered even more so at the Sea of Galilee, the low tides exposed something that had been previously concealed underwater. Although the brothers were fishermen by occupation, they were amateur archaeologists by heart and craved the experience of discovering some fascinating historic relics. So the very hint of something out of the ordinary jutting out and breaking through the sand was enough to spark their interest, and so they investigated a bit further. As it turns out, it would be their lucky day as unbeknownst to them, they had a rather mighty discovery at their fingertips. Once it became clear that the brothers had their hands on something of potential value, they reported their find to the authorities, who subsequently sent archaeologists to investigate the scene. Upon inspection, it became clear that it was a boat of some sort embedded within the shore sediment. News quickly spread pertaining to the boat, some even claiming that it possessed large quantities of gold within, which prompted security measures to be put in place to guard the discovery, as it was still in the process of being excavated from the sediment. Excavators took extensive measures to be delicate in excavating the vessel for fear of ruining it in the process. As it became increasingly evident by its sensitive nature that it was potentially an antique treasure. Turns out they were right. After twelve long days and nights of excavation, the boat was finally free from its hiding place. Time was of the essence too because at any point of time the tide could resume to a higher tide which would disturb and make the excavation process a lot more difficult and maybe even impossible. To both protect and make sure it was safe while relocating it. It wouldn't be until seven years later that the public would be able to lay eyes on it. For preservation measures, it had to be submerged in a chemical solution for that length of time and this was to ensure that it wouldn't turn to dust. The boat itself was 27 feet long, 7.5 feet wide and 4.3 feet in height and would have been able to carry up to 15 people. Today, it can be cited as at Yigal Allen Museum in Kibbutz Genosa, the same region it was discovered in. Archaeologists were able to trace the boat back and said that it dated somewhere between 40 BC and 50 AD. Different parts of the boat date back to certain periods in time, suggesting that it most likely survived several repairs. It has been identified as being constructed from cedar wood, however, it also appears to have other types of wood incorporated into it, which further suggests and supports the idea that it underwent repairs. The bottom of the boat is characterized to be flat for the purpose of being used for fishing in shallow waters. This is so that it doesn't hit the sediment below. Archaeologists suggested that it once had a mast for the purpose of sailing. Also, for oars were identified which meant it could also be controlled manually through rowing. The boat was an exceptional find not only in the eyes of historians and archaeologists alike, but also for followers of sacred texts such as the Quran, Torah, and Bible. This is due to different mentions of boats similar to the one found being used for both transport and fishing by ancient predecessors and important figures. It's suspected that Jesus himself utilized such a boat. It does seem that the boat fits this time range and is of the type that would have been used by Jesus and his disciples. First century synagogue discovered at Beit Shemesh. Another discovery was made in Israel and just as with the Galilee boat, the discovery was made unsuspectingly. As the Beit Shemesh area of Israel was in the works of being expanded in 2017, archaeologists noticed what appeared to be stone walls. This prompted further investigation that included archaeologists, as well as a team of young volunteers to continue digging on the site. 
Once they reached what appeared to be a floor, it became clear that they had discovered an ancient church. Other discoveries were jewelry that had crosses on them, incense burners, and even a divider. This discovery fits in with the history of the area, as during 306 to 337 CE when the synagogue was still standing, Christianity would have been the dominant religion throughout the area. The church was identified by archaeologists as being an important building within the area. This conclusion was made based on a variety of different things, including the mosaic tiling and marble. It's not the fact that there is mosaic tiling adorning the floors that makes it particularly outstanding, but rather the images that are depicted. The church consists of a mosaic tiling depicting images of birds and trees, which as historians have concluded is a unique art piece that wouldn't have come cheap. It was common for other churches and buildings to have mosaic tiling, as that was a common trait of the era, but they would be available in a series of pre-designed options. In the Beit Skamesh Church's case, all evidence points to the fact that the design was one that was definitely customized specifically for that church. Historians have also concluded that the green mosaic tiling used for the depiction of the tree must have been imported. That would have cost an additional price, which further shows how important this particular church was. A relic of the precious blood in 1247, King Henry III claimed to have his hands on an incredibly precious artifact a vial containing Jesus' blood. He instructed his nobles to gather for a meeting at Westminster Abbey, London, for the purpose of sharing something with them. This was of the utmost importance, but at the time did not say exactly what he would be disclosing prior to the event. In vague terms as a holy benefit, as the nobles eagerly and curiously gathered, King Henry finally disclosed the reasoning behind such a gathering. He relayed that he was in possession of what he claimed to be drops of Jesus' blood, which was securely enclosed within a vial. His claims were backed up by various means that would have indicated immense credibility at the time, such as seals from bishops, knights, templars, and the patriarch of Jerusalem. The king ceremoniously carried the vial within his own hands, taking it to the abbey where he entrusted it in the hands of monks. The bishop claimed that whoever praised the relic would be blessed with six years plus 160 days of indulgences. For avid Christian followers, this was most certainly a holy benefit. Surprisingly though, the reveal of the relic did not gather as much attention as one would expect. This was probably due to the fact that its authenticity and credibility was questioned. Another similar relic was claimed to have been found in a different abbey located in Gloucestershire. This artifact was met with a lot more excitement. As it turns out though, whoever doubted the authenticity of the relic was not wrong to do so. In fact, King Henry VIII put the vial to the test. The examiners concluded that it was not Jesus' blood, but rather a combination mixture of saffron and maybe goose blood. Some argue that it may have been presented as a political move on King Henry III's part to gain the trust of his people. Today, other exhibits with the same claims exist, with the most famous one being the Basilica of the Holy Blood located in Belgium. But what do you make of these discoveries? Someone made a post on Reddit, asking those who'd been in the military to reveal the strangest things they'd encountered. One man detailed that he and his team had encountered something strange in the sky, although he didn't disclose the location or his name saying that he didn't want to give himself away. He said that during the early 2000s, he and his team were patrolling an area during the night, and it was during this patrol that they all witnessed something they couldn't. He said that night patrols weren't uncommon, but said that it only made the experience more eerie, saying that he was glad it wasn't just him that was out there. He and his team observed what appeared to be a large pulsating orb, saying that it was bright, was able to pulsate, could move around the sky at extreme speeds without making a sound, and was also incredibly hard to focus on. The other members were just as confused, as they couldn't link it to something they had seen. He said the following, I couldn't understand what this thing was. None of us could. It was flying around in the sky at high speeds, stopping and then shooting away again. It was like this thing was searching for something. There was no navigation like that you'd see on a passenger plane or a stealth fighter. In fact, this thing wasn't even in the shape of a plane. It was more like a sphere, 
During the encounter, the team watched as this thing flew around in the sky, pulsating and stopping and then flying away again. They estimated that this object was between 10 and 20 feet, but said it was hard to make an accurate guess as to how big this was. They also noted that it was extremely hard to focus on, saying that one of the team got out their field binoculars and tried to see what this thing was. But he said no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't focus on this object. He said it was like this object was giving off something, and this stopped him from being able to get a good look at it. The whole encounter lasted no longer than five minutes, and left each one of the team confused about what they just witnessed. He said it was also unnerving to see such a thing while they were out in the field. He said that word got back to higher personnel about the encounter, noting that it wasn't him that told anyone. He said though he was pulled aside by higher ranking officials and was asked about the encounter. He detailed everything but when he asked them about what they thought it was, he was told that it was likely nothing and said that they told him that he won't be talking about this event further. He said that the manner in which they said it almost came across as threatening. Although he said he listened and that the team didn't discuss it further, it only caused him to question it even more. He's not sure whether this was some type of experiment that they'd witnessed by accident, or whether this was a UFO, with him noting that this type of subject is not openly talked about. He said that after going online, he saw that he wasn't the only one who'd seen similar-looking crafts, and even said that he's reached out to people in order to get to the bottom of what it was that he and his team encountered. He ended by saying that he's never seen anything similar. Interestingly, everything that the military officials said mirrors what others have seen. These objects are often described as glowing, unidentified flying objects, or some just call them orms. They're notoriously difficult to photograph. As amateur researchers say, they give off some type of field that makes them look constantly blurry. They said it's one of the reasons why these crafts are so difficult to photograph. These objects have been seen and photographed worldwide, with recent ones being captured above Turkey. Some describe the UFO as being a series of glowing lights that stayed in a strict formation, while others said the lights actually belonged to one craft, saying this was in the shape of a triangle or a boomerang. Those who saw the light said it moved slowly in the sky without making a sound. Not long after this, eyewitnesses started to post their photographs online, which in turn caused people from around the world to question what was happening. This caused a hashtag to go viral, with hundreds of thousands of people talking about it and retweeting and liking the images that were posted. What was strange though is that many of these images soon started to vanish with accounts being blocked and others who engaged in the conversation being silenced. Came as no surprise that people wanted answers for what was going on, with one person saying the following, are we just going to ignore the fact that there's a giant sun at craft above Turkey right now? While another person said this, why are images being taken offline? Thousands of people are seeing these things yet there's no answer for what they are. Others have reported these glowing objects were able to move between things like buildings and forests, saying that they're extremely agile and much faster than anything we have. Even the government have started to open up about these crafts, and have said in declassified documents that they were able to outmaneuver their jets, and then would suddenly vanish into nothing. These eyewitness accounts and documents have caused a variety of different theories to be put forward. Believers have said it's obvious that these mysterious crafts are under intelligent control, while non-believers have said they could be things like natural phenomena. Although many don't believe this as it's obvious that these crafts are being controlled, because whenever they're approached or chased they fly off. As of right now there's no definitive answer for what these crafts are, and how they're able to do the things they do. So what do you make of this military man's encounter? And what do you think he saw? Also, have you seen one of these glowing UFOs? And if so, what do you think they are? These days it can seem like scientists and researchers are making mind-blowing discoveries each and every minute. From the outer reaches of space to our long-forgotten past, we are only starting to scratch the surface of what we can potentially uncover. So today we'll be taking a look at these three recent discoveries. Such historians uncover long-lost World War I tunnel in France where 270 Germans were buried alive. 
During the Battle of the Chemin de Dame in 1917, several hundred German soldiers took refuge in an underground passage to escape the French guns. They didn't make it out alive and this location became an enigma for more than a century. Covered by a thick shroud of limestone and sand, awaits some 250 bodies of German soldiers buried in a tunnel a century ago. The position and the very existence of this tunnel have long been a mystery, an enigma finally solved in rather unorthodox conditions, which is a story within a story. The story is more than a hundred years old and, as the Volksbund, which is a German association that cares for German war graves well remembers, it is one of the countless tragedies of the First World War. On May 4, 1917, more than 200 German soldiers were buried in the Winterberg Tunnel, near the Ladies' Road by a French shell that closed the entrance. As the oxygen ran out, the men suffocated and lost their lives, or took their own lives. Only three soldiers held out long enough before they were rescued, a day before the ridge was occupied by French troops. One of these survivors, Carl Fisser, left a harrowing account of that agony. Everyone was begging for water, but in vain. A comrade lay on the ground beside me and croaked in a broken voice for someone to load his firearm. The names of the victims have been known since then and their fate was documented. But their bodies were never recovered. Both the German Association and the French National Office of Former Combatants and War Victims with French archaeologists been searching for years for the famous tunnel, researching archives, checking documents, and comparing historical maps with current topography to pinpoint the exact location of the tunnel. Now, at last, they believe they have found it. The site where the men of the 111th Reserve Infantry Regiment from the southern Baden region suffocated during the Second Battle of Ain and would have been on a wooded hillside near the French town of Cron, 160 kilometers northeast of Paris. Alan Malinowski and his son Pierre, amateur historians, found the entrance to the tunnel and carried out an illegal excavation at the site they had identified. There they found firearms, ammunition, bayonets and hundreds of gas mask canisters, as well as the remains of two soldiers. Pierre then plugged the hole and contacted the authorities. German and French experts have agreed to carry out further technical investigations in the spring. The risks posed by ammunition and chemical residues which can come to light through earthworks, must be taken into account. When the results of these investigations are available, legal bodies will decide together with community representatives on the future of the Winterberg Tunnel. For 1,500-year-old megalithic Superhenge buried one mile from Stonehenge, a team of archaeologists from the University of Bradford have reported that around 100 monoliths are buried just three kilometers from the popular Stonehenge in what appears to be the largest Neolithic monument built in the United Kingdom. The stones, some up to five meters high, constitute a construction five times larger than Stonehenge, which earned it the name Superhenge. The Neolithic structure, which was arranged in a C-shape and bordered a valley, is 4,500 years old is located at the Dyington Walls archaeological site and is believed to have been used for religious rites and solstice rituals. Vince Gaffney, an archaeological science expert and one of the leaders of the project, said they had discovered one of the largest monuments in Europe that had been right under our noses for about 4,000 years. Without the need to excavate using technologies for subway investigation, including sophisticated radar, Scientists have detected 30 intact rocks and fragments of 60 others. They estimate that the structure may have been erected more than 4,500 years ago, at the same time Stonehenge was built, and that the complex may have been a gigantic ceremonial complex. The newly discovered structure is believed to have formed the perimeter of a kind of circus for rituals, supported by a natural depression in the ground surrounded by a moat 17 meters wide, facing the Avon River. The discovery, according to those responsible, opens a door to the knowledge of the Neolithic culture in the British Isles. It is believed that, at some point, the custodians of the supposed ceremonial complex of the Doington Walls, where Stonehenge and the new structure are located, decided to knock down the rocks of the latter and cover them with earth. It is not known at this time how long it remains standing. The finding is in addition to those made a year ago which discovered a complex of temples and tombs under Stonehenge. 
The new discoveries may drastically change what was taken for granted about this Neolithic complex. Everything that has been written about the landscape of Stonehenge and the ancient monuments it houses, and that is going to add a new chapter of stories. Mystery ancestor mated with ancient humans. The desire of Homo sapiens to mate with their archaic relatives has long preoccupied researchers. Now scientists have discovered evidence of a previously unknown human species in the genome of West Africans. Modern man, Homo sapiens mated with Neanderthals in Europe and fathered children. This is well known. Now a study in the journal Science Advances shows that fertile exchanges also took place in Africa between Homo sapiens and an archaic human species. Fossilized bones do not exist of this apparently irresistible human relative. Instead, geneticists of the University of California discovered traces of the previously unknown prehistoric human in the genomes of present-day West Africans. The researchers refer to this as a ghost population. The discovery provides new clues the genetic diversity of the genus Homo in Africa, which could previously only be reconstructed in fragments from fossils. The geneticists discovered the clues to the new human species during a genetic analysis. They compared the DNA of West Africans with that of Neanderthals and so-called Denisovan humans, another species closely related to Neanderthals. Genetic traces of both prehistoric humans are found in the genome of every modern human. In the genome of some West Africans, however, scientists have now discovered additional previously unknown genetic snippets that they have assigned to the new, unknown relative. The modeling of the geneticists shows that the ways of the modern human being and the spirit relative initially separated about one million years ago in Africa. About 50,000 years ago, however, the two unequal partners met again. Researchers are still puzzling over whether the genetic traces point to a known archaic human species or actually belong to a new species. One million years ago, Homo erectus lived in Africa, presumably the first human species that used fire and could walk like a modern human. Did the ghost species resemble that prehistoric fellow? In the late 1960s, Archaeologists in Nigeria found the so-called Iwo Alaru skull and dated it to be about 11,200 years old. The geneticists suspect that this human skull could have belonged to a representative of their spirit species. What do you make of these recent discoveries? People go missing every day, whether intentionally or as a result of more sinister or tragic means. And unfortunately, many people who vanish under mysterious circumstances are never seen or heard from again. Although police and search parties do their best to hunt for clues that could offer closure to the families or justice for the victims, sometimes answers are not found until much later. And occasionally cases turn cold and remain unsolved to this day. So today, we will be looking at three instances of strange or mysterious disappearances and the circumstances surrounding their cases. Swiss couple missing for 75 years found in melting Alps Glacier. Marceline and Francine Dumoulin were ordinary parents who had made ordinary lies for themselves in Switzerland. In 1942, they were 40 and 37 years old respectively and had made a comfortable home in the Swiss Alps with their seven children. Marceline was a shoemaker and his wife Francine worked as a teacher at the local school. They kept several cows in a nearby meadow that Marceline took care of. As Francine was usually pregnant and was not able to clamber through the steep, snow-laden hills and valleys that made up the mountainous glacial region where they lived. However, on August 15, 1942, Francine went with Marceline on a rare trip to help milk the cows in a meadow above Chandelin, in the Valais Canton. It was a beautiful day and the couple were happy as they set off towards the valley. Tragically, the day ended on a much darker note when the couple did not return from their chores. Their children, family, and neighbors searched for them, while the oldest sibling Monique cared for her six siblings. However, as days passed and there was no trace of Marceline and Francine, the children were eventually split up and raised by other family members, although they never stopped hoping that one day their parents might be found. We spent our whole lives looking for them without stopping. We thought that we could give them the funeral they deserved one day, said their youngest daughter. Yet the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into years, 
and after decades hope was all but lost. Yet in 2017, 75 years after that fateful day, two bodies were discovered frozen, 8,600 feet up in the San Floron Glacier by a worker performing maintenance on a ski lift above the La Diabla Ray Resort. The bodies were lying extremely near each other and had been so perfectly preserved in the glacier through the years that their 1940s-era clothes were easily distinguishable. Many of their possessions were also found nearby in a similarly preserved state, including their clothes, hiking boots, a hat, backpacks, a bottle, a book, and a watch. The police were notified and a helicopter arrived to remove the entire block of ice surrounding the remains so that they could be removed without any destruction to the preserved bodies. DNA tests were performed that immediately confirmed what was already suspected. The bodies in the glacier were those of Marceline and Francine Dumoulin. Those in charge of excavating and examining the bodies for burial suspect that the unfortunate couple likely fell while climbing the treacherous glacial terrain and slipped into a crevasse where their bodies were frozen for decades in the cold, dry conditions of the Alps. The San Flaren Glacier where the bodies were found is currently receding at a rate of about a meter to a meter and a half per year due to the warmer weather. And this rapid shrinking finally uncovered the bodies that had been lying beneath the hard-packed ice for three quarters of a century, solving a cold case that had long been given up on. The Dumoulin case is not the first one to have been solved by global warming either. 280 people have gone into the Alps and never returned. And as the ice shelf begins to shrink, some of these bodies have been able to be recovered after decades. As for the Dumoulins, their remaining children are relieved to finally have some answers. I can say that after 75 years of waiting, this news gives me a deep sense of calm. For the funeral, I will not wear black. I think that white would be more appropriate. It represents hope, which I never lost. Reports their youngest daughter now in her 80s and at long last she can finally have some closure. Ireland's vanishing triangle when multiple women go missing from the same general area. Police immediately begin to suspect a serial maniac and start hunting for clues that might lead them to the bodies. However, the disappearances of eight girls within an 80-mile radius of Dublin Island were so mysterious and strange, with no bodies or crime scenes ever found, that police were never able to determine what had happened to the women, causing the area to be dubbed the vanishing triangle. After the similarly mysterious Bermuda Triangle due to the fact that it really appeared as though the girls had simply vanished from the face of the earth. Annie McCarrick, Eva Brennan, Imelda Keenan, Jojo Dullard, Kira Breen, Fiona Pender, Fiona Sinnott and Deidre Jacob all went missing around Dublin between 1993 and 1998, and police were never able to find any conclusive evidence. That foul play had occurred or even a rational explanation as to what had happened. Many girls disappear as they walk through busy streets and Deidre Jacob was confirmed to have been seen mere yards from her parents' house, although she never arrived. However, there have been signs that pointed to something more menacing than a simple Bermuda Triangle phenomenon. A small wooden cross with Fiona Pender's name on it was discovered near the Inn 2008 leading some to believe that she was buried somewhere nearby. Fiona Sinat's personal belongings were missing from her apartment and were later found in trash bags dumped in a farmer's field, as though whoever put them there wanted to create the appearance that Fiona had left intentionally. Convicted criminal Larry Murphy also lived in the vicinity of several of the girls' last known locations, but police were never able to connect him to the disappearances although it is still widely thought that he had something to do with at least a few of the cases. The similarity of the cases also points to a serial maniac, as all of the women were young and mysteriously vanished, indicating that if they were abducted that the attacker likely used the same methods. However, over two decades later, there have still been no clues that can help answer questions about the tragic and mysterious disappearances that left families with no closure or answers about their loved ones and no justice for the eight girls who were never found. Annette Sayers' disappearance on the morning of October 4, 1988. 11-year-old Annette Sayers was seen at approximately 7 a.m. standing with her dog at the school bus stop in Mount Holly, South Carolina. This was the last time that she was ever seen. When her stepfather, Steve Malinowski, returned to their home on the grounds of Mount Holly Plantation, 
where he worked as a caretaker and realized that Annette had not returned from school. She was reported missing. A search of the grounds and the bus stop revealed no clues, except for a hastily penciled note that read, Dad, Mama came back. Give the boys a hug. That was determined by handwriting experts to have indeed been written by Annette. The strangest part of the disappearance lies in the fact that Annette went missing from the same area that her mother, Karina Malinowski, went missing from almost a year earlier. Karina had reportedly left the cabin where they lived after a row. With Steve, when her boss came to check on her after she did not show up for work, he found her car parked at the plantation entrance next to the bus stop. She was never seen or heard from again, and it was presumed that she took a bus and left the family. However, Annette's disappearance and note shed new light on the situation. Although no other clues were ever found, some think that Karina, knowing that Annette would be waiting at the bus stop, came and took her daughter. Although there are those that have more sinister theories. Steve and Karina were known to have frequent arguments and it was said by one of their children that Steve battled various addictions. So some think that Karina may have lost her life as a result of a fight gone wrong and that Annette knew that her mother had not really walked off, leaving Steve feeling as though he had no choice but to make her write the note and then take her out too. And less than a year after Annette's disappearance, he left South Carolina and moved to Florida, giving up the two sons that he had with Karina for adoption. Police working the case do not believe that Annette was taken by her mother and have listed the case as a non-family abduction, continuing to exhaust all possibilities surrounding the disappearance of the young girl. Since that fateful day, police have looked into several leads, but there have been no other clues and the case eventually went cold, leaving locals wondering whether it was simply a matter of a mother running away and then returning for her child, or if a criminal had been living among them. But what do you make of these tragic stories? Since the Large Hadron Collider first started up on September 10, 2008, it's been at the center of many incredible discoveries. So today, we'll be taking a look at these Large Hadron Collider discoveries. Intriguing Large Hadron Collider discovery particle physicists around the world are intrigued with the latest data from the Large Hadron Collider beauty, known as LHCB detector, which introduced evidence as an unknown discrepancy between electron and muon behavior. This detector monitors proton-proton collisions as well as the rare decay of beam mesons, which are particles containing beauty quarks. The experiment has discovered a difference in the rate of decline in muons compared with the one to electrons. Rare decays are a unique method that particle physicists use to find heavy particles. They do not just hurl protons at each other and look for new particles in the aftermath. Instead, it focuses on the minute variations in every event. The rare decays can hint at the existence of unknown particles, which the researchers can piece together after many experiments. The standard model theory explains that leptons like muons and electrons are identical in the forces they obey, except for their mass. It is expected that the B-mesons decay at the exact same rate to muons as they do to electrons. However, the LHCB calculates that it seems to decay 15% less often to muons than to electrons, since it will prove there is more to lepton treatments than only the standard model. Over the years, there have been various discrepancies found between electrons and muons within experiments like LHCB, although none of them panned out. After more data was collected and investigated, the differences disappeared, and the standard model was once again the leading theory. Physicists have been trying to prove their theories that leptons have but have been unsuccessful so far. These new findings are significant and can potentially provide the proof needed to beat the reigning theory finally. The evidence has statistical importance of 3.1 sigma, which means that the statistical fluctuations meet the minimum requirements for new physics. However, it should be noted that the 5 sigma is the ideal standard to prove a discovery in new particle physics. Physicists are excited to find concrete evidence of this decay rate difference among electrons and muons. They believe there could be some truth to the pattern. There are still many theoretical uncertainties that the researchers need to consider, especially when comparing their results against the baseline standard model. Theoreticians have been eagerly updating their proposed models since the results of the LHCB's experiments were announced. 
This discrepancy will need much more research and data before anyone accepts this new particle and model. The LHCB is currently down for maintenance and will return next year with upgraded hardware and detectors. There are other experiments in Japan and Illinois, USA, which can help corroborate this rising theory and shed some light on the differences between muons and electrons. However, physicists are trying not to raise their hopes or hype it too much, just in case it is another fluctuation. CERN makes a bold push to build a $23 billion super collider. The European Particle Physics Lab, CERN, is aiming to build a 100km super collider worth $23 billion in the hopes of uncovering the Higgs boson's properties. They hope to take the next step forward in high-energy physics with this enormous circular machine. Although the CERN Council approved it last summer, they still need global assistance in order to fund the project. The new collider is designed to collide electrons with positrons, their antimatter partners, to help physicists study the Higgs boson particles. At this moment in time, it is expected to take around 20 years to build. The device will be made in an underground tunnel located in Geneva, Switzerland, near CERN's headquarters. Although the council made the initial step and approved the project, it is not yet entirely accepted and moving forward. Since it is a massive undertaking, it still needs a final go-ahead from leading councils and investors. However, it gives CERN the chance to dive completely into designing and researching this collider and setting aside other responsibilities for the time being. They have the opportunity to focus on a different topic and create alternative designs for developmental research. The CERN Council is excited by the encouragement and potential financing from European countries to pursue this project. They gave unanimous support to begin this monumental task and take a significant step forward in particle physics research. There will be two stages of development for this project, an electron-positron collider and a proton-proton smasher. CERN will first build their collider to study the production and effects of the Higgs boson in greater detail, which will take until the middle of the century. In the second half of the century, this collider will be replaced with the smasher. Their goal is to reach collision energies of about 100 tier electron volts, or TeV, to search for new particles of forces and update the current standard model of particle physics. The most powerful proton accelerator in the world is currently at 16 TeV. The technology for this stage of development does not yet exist. So it will be the focus of a lot of study and experiments in the next few decades as they prepare for it. The proposal is gaining a lot of traction and praise for its detailed and ambitious yet practical strategy. CERN is looking towards a bright future and hoping to pioneer the field of particle physics. Other experiments and organizations around the world are encouraged by Europe's endorsement and the potential for international participation. The CERN lab currently operates a collider called High Luminosity LHC, which they will continue to run while building the new collider. Their plans estimate that the 100 kilometers tunnel and collider's construction will begin in 2038, only if they receive adequate funding. It might not be enough only to have financial backing from Europe. Ideally, countries like the USA, China and Japan would be involved and join together to form an international physics organization to help see the project come to fruition. Physicists find ultra-rare triple-glue ball particle after 48 years. It has taken physicists just under half a century to confirm the theory about the triple glue ball particle. This particle, known as odoron, was first predicted by scientists in 1973, but was never seen in the real world. It is an ultra-rare and short-lived combination of three gluons, which are tiny particles. Scientists theorized that the odoron would occur when protons smash together at extremely high speeds although they could not figure out the exact conditions needed. Odorons are unique particles formed with three sticky gluons, which serve an essential role in the makeup of protons and neutrons. Gluons carry the strong force, one of the fundamental forces of the universe that glue quarks together and allows them to form protons and neutrons, then binding them together with atomic nuclei. When protons smash into each other in colliders, they break apart nearly three-quarters of the time. In a quarter of the experiments, though, they bounce off each other and survive the collision. This could be due to the exchange of some gluons between particles during the interaction. 
proton-proton and proton-antiproton collisions exchange particles and sometimes result in a global, where two or three gluons emerge. Although scientists had already witnessed a double global, they recently confirmed the existence of the odorin, a triple glue ball. After spending decades examining data from two colliders, scientists have uncovered enough conclusive evidence to indicate the rare particle's existence. Researchers collected information from the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, in Geneva, a 27-kilometer circular atom slammer that discovered the Higgs boson and the now defunct Tevatron in Illinois, USA, which is a 6.3-kilometer long collider that slammed protons and antiprotons together. The researchers theorized that the varying rates in the two types of collisions would reveal odorons, because there would be a minute difference between the frequencies of protons bouncing off of antiprotons and other protons. They instituted a mathematical approach to compare the data from the two colliders since they occurred at differing energy levels, producing a graph they then called the money plot. This plotted graph reveals the existence of the odoron in the space between the two types of collisions. They do not line up exactly, which implies the particle exists. It also has a five sigma statistical significance, solidifying the proof and reaching the gold standard in determining new particles. The odds of this gap occurring without influence from odorons is about one in 3.5 million. Despite having predicted its existence nearly 50 years ago, scientists argue that the odoron will not alter any aspect of the way we approach or understand physics. Some researchers even reject it being considered a true particle, arguing that it is only a quasi-particle since it is temporarily arranged of smaller particles. Regardless, the recent evidence is crucial to the science community because it confirms the theory about the different rates of collisions. The 1973 prediction was correct, but what do you make of these discoveries? Gateway Experience Study Declassified back in 2003, a government document between an independent researcher and a United States Army commander shows undeniable proof of a strange CIA experiment known as the Gateway Process Experience that was created to enhance the brain of an individual in the effort to give them mental superpowers that would help them to achieve a higher mental capacity than is capable for the average person. The researcher mentioned key researchers known in the field of psychology, neuroscience, and studies in the realm of consciousness, including Israeli inventor Ishtak Bentov, of whom invented the first EKG electrodes to measure accurate brain waves. The document then goes on to detail a process that would allow the brain waves of the left and right hemisphere of the brain to reach matching frequencies at the theta level. This is accomplished via assistive hypnosis from trained psychologists. Techniques in transcendental meditation and utilizing the human body's natural frequency following response. In the document, the researcher details the following statement. To achieve synchronization of brain hemispheres, the hemisync technique takes advantage of a phenomenon known as the frequency following response, or FFR, which means that if a subject hears a sound produced at a frequency which emulates one of those associated with the operation of the human brain, the brain will try to mimic the same frequency pattern by adjusting its brainwave output. Therefore, if the subject is in a fully awake state but hears sound frequencies which approximate brainwave output at the theta level, the subject's brain will endeavor to alter its brainwave pattern from the normal beta to the theta level. Once this artificial form of enlightenment is achieved, however, the subjects are trained in advanced problem-solving total memory recall, with photographic and holographic memory recall the ability to learn new skills at an increased rate, as well as experience out-of-body astral projection that supposedly allows for remote viewing and the accurate prediction of future events. Case of Imad Elawar This Case which is among the earliest of Ian Stevenson's investigations, is the one he considers the strongest. Ahmad Elawar was born to a Druze family in Cornell Village, Lebanon, on the 21st of December 1958. As the family narrated later to Stevenson, Imad's first words were Jamia and Mahmoud at about 18 months of age. He started talking of his past life, sometimes in his sleep saying that he was in the Bohamsi family from the Kribe village. He mentioned Jamila repeatedly, saying that she was prettier than his mother and that she wore high heels and loved red clothes. He said he owned guns, a small yellow car, a truck, and a bus. He described, in particular, a fatal accident involving a truck driving over a man and breaking both of his legs and additional injuries that led to the loss of the man's life. 
Imad talked of a quarrel between the man and the truck driver, and he was thought to believe that the accident was deliberate. He also talked of a bus accident and also expressed the delight in being able to walk. Ahmad's father warned him against making up stories about his past life, so he stopped telling him and confided in his mum and paternal grandparents. One day as he was walking in the streets with his grandmother, Imad recognized a stranger and told him they had been neighbors. It was later confirmed that this person was a Kribi resident, convincing Imad's parents that there could be some truth in his statements. Stevenson first interviewed Imad's parents and a member of the Bahamzi family in 1964 and later in 1968, 1969, 1972 and lastly in 1973. Imad's family recorded that Imad claimed to have been Mahmoud Bahamzi from Kribi and that he died in a truck accident after a crawl with the truck driver. Imad's family and Stevenson later visited Kribi village and found the house where Imad had claimed he had lived. They were able to confirm some of the facts as accurate and Imad recognized his uncle Mahmoud and Jamali. He also recalled where he had kept his gun. From Stevenson's records, Imad's case was particularly convincing despite having a few complexities and mismatches in the accounts narrated. Neil Doverstone An incident that happened far away from America is that of Neil Doverstone. This is a story that some people believe will stay a mystery as the police couldn't find out if the passing away of Neil Doverstone was caused by himself or another person. This event took place in Saddleworth, England. A man was reported to have taken a flight from Pakistan to London on the 10th of December 2015. From there, he found his way to Saddleworth, where he went to ask for the directions to the top of the mountain from a pub landlord, Mel Robinson. According to Mel, he was seeing the man for the first time in his pub and didn't look like a traveler because he had no luggage or a suitcase with him. He said the man was dressed in a Mac coat, plain trousers and loafers on his feet. Mel said he gave the man the description and left his pub thereafter. On the December 12, 2015, a cyclist named Stuart Crowther who was riding through the hills of Saddleworth more noticed a man lounging on the bank of the hills. He called to the man, but it was apparent that something was wrong as the man wasn't responding. On moving close to the man, Stewart realized the man had passed away, and it turned out to be the same man from the pub. An alarm was raised, and the police were sent to the location. The police found 130 pounds in his coat pocket and an empty medicine box which had viroxine sodium written on it in both Gurdu and English. The identity of the man became a mystery because no passport or driving license was found on him. The man was nicknamed Neil Doverstone, with some reports claiming that the man had a heart attack, while other reports claimed that he was poisoned after it was found in his system following an autopsy. The question on the minds of everyone is, did the man take the poison by himself or was he poisoned by someone else? Coral Castle one of the strangest mysteries surrounding ancient megalithic constructions is trying to understand the exact process as to how the ancient people of early civilizations were capable of moving massive stones on their own without modern-day advanced technologies. Although a number of theories have been passed around, there is no accepted scientific consensus surrounding any of the working theories surrounding megalithic construction of the ancient days due to the time constraints of such projects. The ancient pyramids of Giza, according to Egyptian receipts and labor accounts, were supposedly constructed in a short 20-year time span, with only roughly 20,000 people working on the project for the entire length of time. To put this number into perspective, the ancient Egyptians would have had to cut a massive stone weighing 10 times the weight of an average car, moved it to the pyramid, and pushed it up a ramp and placed it into position once every two minutes per person without a single rest for 20 years. Interestingly enough, back in 1923, a man by the name of Edward Leedskonen claimed to have solved the mystery of the ancient pyramid construction techniques and, in an effort to prove his theories, spent 28 years alone trying to create his own massive megalithic structure on a plot of land in the city of Homestead located in the state of California. Although Edward Leed Scanlon would never reveal the mystery of how the process of megalithic constructions could be replicated with basic tools and manpower, he would go on to construct his own megalithic structure known as Coral Castle. Edward left behind a large number of pamphlets and tour guide information for Coral Castle to be later turned into a museum of some sort featuring information surrounding anti-gravity applications and theories on magnetic field lines all around the Earth. That would allow him to construct the stones via electromagnetic levitation. To this day, 
No one is certain how Coral Castle was built as Edward Leeds Scownan would die due to a kidney infection without ever sharing his knowledge or finishing his construction. Chiron Horman Our last case is the sad case of Chiron Horman, a young boy who disappeared in 2010 aged just seven years old. After his mother started suffering from challenging health issues, Chiron went to live with his father, Kane, and his new partner, Terry. On the 4th of June 2010, Chiron's stepmother, Terry, took him to Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon, where he was a student in the second grade. They attended a science fair at the school before she said goodbye. Terry says she saw Kieran walking down the corridor to attend his first class at around 8.45 a.m. and then drove away from the school to run some errands. Terry returned home where she uploaded photos to Facebook of Kieran attending the science fair. However, Kieran never made it to class and his teacher marked him as absent that day. Within an hour of saying goodbye to his stepmother, the young boy had seemingly vanished without a trace. After school, Terry and Kieran's father walked to the bus stop to wait for him. They expected that, like on any other day, Kieran would have taken the school bus home. However, after talking to the driver, they were horrified to discover that Kieran had never boarded the bus home. Immediately, they called the school and the secretary reported that Kieran had not even made it to his first class that morning. What could possibly have happened to this little boy? Frustratingly for all involved, very little concrete progress has been made with the investigation into Kieran's disappearance. Despite significant media interest and thorough searches of the area conducted by trained searchers and hundreds of volunteers. Despite reports from Kieran's mother that the search had been narrowed down to less than 100 acres, 10 years on, we still do not know what happened to Kieran. Kieran's mother Desiree has often stated her belief that Terry may be in some way responsible for Kieran's disappearance and even tried to file a civil lawsuit against her in 2012. It must be noted that Terry Horman has never been identified as a suspect in this case. Indeed, not one suspect or even a description of a suspect has ever been identified in the 10 years since Karen's disappearance. Whatever the circumstances behind this bizarre and tragic case, let's hope that one day, Karen's family gain closure and somehow find the strength to move on with their lives after enduring what is surely every parent's worst nightmare. It's sad to think that families and loved ones are left in the unknown. We can only hope that future advancements in technology may solve some of these mysteries and provide much-needed closure for the families of the victims. Sub-zero temperatures can preserve even the most ancient mysteries, freezing them in time. It has been rumored that Walt Disney himself is currently frozen and waiting to be reanimated in the future. While that is an interesting theory, the following discoveries are very real and will have you wondering what other massive discoveries lie frozen in ice. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three interesting discoveries. Body of missing climber Patrice Hevert found on Mont Blanc after 32 years. Our first chilling discovery takes place in the French Alps, where climbers would discover a mystery over three decades old buried beneath the snow. With a summit of over 15,000 feet, Mont Blanc is the tallest mountain in the Alps and all of Europe. Many consider the mountain to be the birthplace of modern mountaineering, explaining why nearly 30,000 climbers attempt to reach the summit each year. In July of 2014, two hikers set out to scale Mont Blanc, but they made a chilling discovery on their journey up the mountain. Frozen on a glacier with his ID, his equipment, and his skis was the body of Patrice Hivert, a French mountain guide trainee that had been reported missing 32 years earlier in 1982. Patrice was only 23 when he began his solo trek up the mountain, with a plan to ski back down after reaching the summit. The storm had hit the range during his climb, obscuring his ascent and causing the hiker to lose his life to the mountain. His father, Gerard Hivert, had completely given up hope of ever finding his son's body. When officials came to his home 32 years after his son's passing to inform him that the body had been found, Gerard was beside himself. Felt like losing his son for a second time. Gerard told Francis RTL Radio, I'm a mountain man, and I would have preferred him to stay up there. He was better on a mountain than in a coffin. He was in his element. Patrice is not the only climber to lose his life to the mountain. 
On average, 100 lives are lost each year trying to reach the summit. The mountain is a technical climb to an experienced hiker, but it is not considered particularly difficult. However, many inexperienced climbers and tourists are drawn to Mont Blanc by the falsely advertised scenic long walk portrayed by local guides. Mont Blanc climber finds 205,000 pounds worth of Indian jewels on glacier. It is estimated that the jewels inside the box were worth over 200,000 pounds. Instead of keeping the treasures, the hiker turned in the box and all of its contents. Each gem was packed into little bags with some labeled made in India. It was that piece of information that would help officials determine that the lost jewels had been there for nearly 50 years. Let us go back to January 1966. The jewels are on board Air India Flight 101 on their way to the Geneva Airport in France. Having miscalculated the aircraft's altitude, the plane's pilot sent the Boeing 707 with its 117 passengers directly into the mountain's summit. The plane left a massive crater in the mountain and was completely pulverized. Nothing could be identified and no passengers survived. Because of the time of year, any attempt to recover debris or bodies was called off because of the weather. Still to this day, pieces of debris are scattered throughout the mountain range. After delivering the box to the police, the jewels were then taken to the mayor of the local town, Shamani, where they would be stored until the rightful owners could claim them. A local historian and acquaintance of the mayor, Francois Ray, speculated that the mayor and the climber had agreed to a 50 to 50 split of the jewels and had no intention of getting them to their rightful owners. Under French law, if no one could make a sound claim to them during a two-year window, they would then belong to the mayor. Ray discovered the name Isherov while going through old insurance documents from a man in London that had filed a claim for lost jewels at the time of the crash. When news of this came out, two separate Isherov families came forward to claim them. Both families, though unrelated, happened to be stone merchants, one from Spain and the other from Russia. It appears that neither family could claim the jewels and it is difficult to find any more information about where they are today. There is a theory surrounding the plane crash itself. One of the 117 passengers on the Air India Flight 101 was Homi J. Barber, an Indian nuclear physicist and father of the Indian nuclear program. The theory comes from the book. Conversations with the Crow, written by journalist Gregory Douglas. The book is a transcription of the alleged phone conversations between Douglas and Robert Crowley, a former CIA officer and second-in-command to the Director of Covert Operations. Among the many pages discussing the CIA's involvement in historical events throughout American political history, there is an alleged conversation with Crowley that suggests the CIA may have been behind the plane crash. The theory suggests that the CIA wanted to sabotage the progress of the Indian nuclear program by eliminating the physicist and did so by planting suitcases with devices in the cargo of the plane. The plane crash occurred just three months after Bobber had said India could build an atom bomb in only 18 months. This theory is purely speculation and based on the transcripts in Douglas' book. Massive discovery of a Yakigir mammoth frozen in the ice and weighing in at over four tons. The Yakigir Mammoth is considered one of the most significant paleontological discoveries in our lifetime. The mammoth was preserved in the permafrost, with much of its carcass still intact after being frozen for an estimated 22,500 years near the village of Yakutia in Arctic Siberia, Russia. It took multiple excavations spanning over several years to gather all the remains of the Yukagir fossil. Once assembled, Scientists determined that the mammoth was male and stood over nine feet tall when alive. While the fully intact specimen is incredible in itself, the animal stall held the most revealing information. With the stomach and intestinal tract still intact, scientists were able to examine the animal's last meal and with that information, conduct and complete environmental reconstruction, enabling them to learn more about its ancestral diet, habitat, and lifestyle. By boiling and sifting the contents of the dung, the different plants and pollen they found indicated that the animal had died in the spring. One notable finding was a complete lack of tree pollen, leading them to believe that the mammoth lived in a treeless environment. This intrigued scientists, as all other woolly mammoths discovered to date contained signs of trees in their stool. 
It seems that this mammoth found a way to get its nutrients by eating the vitamin-dense meadow grasses found along the marshes where the mammoth was discovered, in a part of Siberia that is still treeless today. The team could not determine an apparent cause of death but speculate that the mammoth was highly malnourished. After a severe winter with little food, the mammoth lay down in the mud that would later engulf most of its body and freeze over until it would be discovered approximately 22,500 years later. Many of the world's mysteries are buried beneath the sand or hidden in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean. If these discoveries have taught us anything, it is that frozen bodies, Mysterious jewels and prehistoric elephants are just some of the incredible findings that await discovery in the ice and snow. What other kinds of mysteries lay frozen beneath the ice waiting to be discovered? Over 10% of the Earth's land area is covered in snow and glaciers, and we have only just scratched the surface. If there is one thing we can be sure of, it is that there are more discoveries out there, frozen in time, waiting to be found. But what do you make of these interesting discoveries? Space exploration is advancing rapidly. Within the last century, we have launched the first rocket, sent a man to the moon, and explored distant planets. Though these soaring advancements come with some moments of confusion, be it from an old photograph, an unexpected discovery, or a strange occurrence, NASA is at the forefront of astronomical developments and missions, and over the years they've made countless discoveries helping us to better understand what's out there in the cosmos. One thing that they're often faced with is the constant reports of strange objects seen close to the International Space Station. And although they have commented that some of these can be explained away as things like space debris, planets, and satellites, there's some that they've remained quiet about. Back in 2016, someone was watching the live cameras from the International Space Station, and they noticed something strange in the background. The object, which was described by the individual as looking like a ship, allegedly approached the space station before the cameras were shut off. Amateur researchers who have looked into these accounts have said this often happens when a strange object approaches the International Space Station, although NASA has said the reason this happens is because the signal drops, which then causes the video feed to cut out. Regardless, the individual is quickly able to take a screenshot of what they were seeing. And since then, different theories have been put forward to try and explain what this thing is. It's actually a pretty clear photograph, and we're able to make out various different things. For example, it looks like this thing has arms coming off it, while others described it as being in the shape of a star. Skeptics have said the object likely has a more earthly origin, and suggested it could have been something like a satellite. NASA said that it's space debris that when these objects approach the space station they can take on a different appearance. Believers have said that hundreds of these objects have been reported close to the International Space Station, saying that they come in all shapes and sizes. Another one that they've said NASA has been silent on is that of a giant triangle. They noted though that the same thing happens every time one of these objects shows up. NASA declines to comment, and the live feed shuts down. It's not just everyday people who have expressed their interest in this topic. Some astronauts have been quite vocal about what's been reported. Dr. Brian O'Leary, former NASA astronaut, said the following, There is abundant evidence that we're being contacted, that civilizations have been visiting us for a very long time, that their appearance is bizarre from any kind of traditional materialistic Western point of view, that these visitors use the technologies of consciousness. They use toroids. They use corrotating magnetic disks for their propulsion systems. They seem to be a common denominator of the UFO phenomenon. Gordon Cooper has also commented on these mysterious objects. Major Gordon Cooper has been part of a number of top-secret missions in space, with several revolving around the use of highly advanced technologies to locate locations of interest. Interestingly, during one of his many space missions, he'd claimed to come into contact with an extraterrestrial craft. During Gordon Cooper's space mission, that included a solo journey with a planned 22-orbit trip around the Earth, he claimed to have seen a glowing object that appeared to be a bright green, and it began to slowly approach his spacecraft as he viewed it through the portal. Additionally, the approach of the object was also picked up by the tracking station located in Australia, confirming Cooper's encounter. 
This would lead to the astronaut eventually agreeing to take on a two-day mission, in which he would work to analyze footage and evidence of extraterrestrial visitations that would eventually lead him to giving a speech to the United Nations to discuss his findings. During his speech he described later coming across evidence of extraterrestrial crafts, going on to say the following, I saw with my own eyes a defined air of ground being consumed by flames, with four indentations left by a flying object, which had descended in the middle of a field. Beings had left the craft. There were other traces to prove this. They seemed to have studied topography. They had collected soil samples and eventually they returned to where they'd come from, disappearing at enormous speed. Gordon Cooper would later go on to be a key figure in the awareness movement and claim that his studies and findings were being covered up by the United States government under the claim that it was a national security threat for inciting panic, despite his many years of working for the government and assisting with efforts during many secret missions. Edgar Mitchell was the sixth person to walk on the moon's surface. He piloted the Apollo 14 lunar module, the first Apollo mission attempting to carry out scientific experiments on the moon. He pursued a military career, joining the U.S. Navy as a pilot in 1948 and was selected by NASA in 1966 to become an astronaut. However, it was towards the end of Mitchell's career and after his retirement that it became the focus of discussion about the potentially paranormal events that occur in space and those that he himself had experienced. It was during the Apollo 14 mission, unbeknownst to the world, that things began to get a little weird with Edgar Mitchell. After experiencing what he described as a spirit above creation, Mitchell became ever more interested in the paranormal phenomena and consciousness. He began to conduct ESP experiments experimenting with psychic abilities such as telepathy, and this was on board the Apollo 14 module. Chillingly, Mitchell's experience did seem to have an effect on him. He and a group of psychics later alleged that they shared mental communications whilst he was in orbit. He later founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which continued the experiments he had been conducting in private and in space. During his lifetime, Mitchell consistently testified to the existence of UFOs. In 1996, in an interview on the American TV program Dateline, Mitchell stated that UFO contact is very strong and that the U.S. government was covering up visits and crashes. So what do you make of these photographs? The space above us is uncharted territory. One of the problems with space exploration is that even our best scientists have said it's unlikely we'll make it past our solar system. It's possible to go beyond our solar system, but using current methods it would take over a thousand years to reach our nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri. Humans have accomplished a lot in a relatively short amount of time. Is anyone's guess as to where we'll be in a thousand years? We only started flying in the sky in 1903, and since then we've created sophisticated aircrafts that are able to go thousands of miles per hour. For years, though, people have been witnessing mysterious crafts in our sky. Even today, with the skies filled with drones, helicopters, and planes, UFOs are still a source of mystery and intrigue. Imagine then the level of disbelief on seeing such objects before the actual invention of the airplane. Whilst we might think of the UFO as being a 20th century phenomenon, the late 19th century saw many astounding reports that brought to those who witnessed them both wonderment and fear in equal measure, but now it seems that we're learning that these crafts have also been seen in space. One recent photograph that's been shared around is this one. It appears to show what looks like a giant planet hovering above the sun. For years now, believers have said that these giant crafts can be seen close to things like our sun and the moon and some of them do look interesting. And one thing we do know is that they're not fakes, as they are coming directly from places like NASA and other space agencies. In some cases, even NASA can't explain what some of these objects are, causing them to remain a mystery. This doesn't mean that it's proof of life. It just means that whatever the object is, it can't be identified. This recent one, though, has divided people. Believers have said they think it shows a mysterious planet, while others have put forward the idea that this is some type of ship and it's using the sun's power. Non-believers, though, have said this isn't a ship, but it's actually a coronal mass ejection. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said the following. These come from the sun's corona. 
They can eject billions of tons of coronal material and carry an embedded magnetic field that is stronger than the background solar wind interplanetary magnetic field strength. CMEs travel outward from the sun at speeds ranging from slower than 250 kilometers per second to as fast as nearly 3,000 kilometers per second. Fastest Earth-directed CMEs can reach our planet in as little as 15 to 18 hours. Slower CMEs can take several days to arrive. Skeptics point out that this is what people are seeing, but not everyone buys this theory, with one person saying the following. Although I agree that this explanation does explain some of the reports, the majority of CMEs do not these are spherical objects, and CMEs normally always look like giant waves of plasma. When looking through images of CMEs, I couldn't find another one that looked like this one. Usually they're thrown out into the cosmos, and don't just sit by the sun like this, end quote. While skeptics pointed out that these cavities can take on the appearance that something lodges there, when in reality what people are seeing is just a CME. Developed as part of the European Space Agency and NASA's HelioViewer project, the Solar Heliospheric Observatory allows anyone to view its entire library. Over the years, it's provided some incredible photographs of our sun. However, some people have noticed large anomalies near our sun. One of the most interesting ones is this photograph allegedly showing a cigar-shaped object. Interestingly, some compared this to a Muamua, which was the first known interstellar object that was detected traveling through our solar system. This image was captured by someone using the Helio Viewer. This allows you to explore the sun, and the program was developed as part of the European Space Agency and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. As stated on the NASA website, it provides a desktop program that enables users to call up images of the sun from the past 15 years. More than a million images from SOHO can be accessed, and new images from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory are being added every day. When this photograph was discovered, it soon made the rounds online, with various people suggesting different theories to explain it. One person said the following, I think this could be a genuine UFO. I've seen similar looking crafts and have no idea what they are. However, another person had another take on the photos. They said that the cigar-shaped object was put there by NASA to hide something. They say this has been done before with things like Moon and Mars photos. The man claimed that there must be something interesting behind the image, and this is the reason they covered it. As of right now, NASA has said this is just an anomaly. Further saying the following, although they may seem pesky, these artifacts and anomalies are normal. They remind us that images like any other form of data don't speak for themselves. What we see is a product both of nature and the instruments we use to observe it. One user said the following, It makes you wonder how many of these Amumu-like objects have traveled through our solar system without us knowing. This can't be the first time it's happened. What if our solar system is full of them? It's only now we've picked up on them. A.V. Loeb, who is the chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, claims that he thinks he's found proof of extraterrestrials, and this comes in the form of a Muamua. Loeb started to open his mind to the possibility that this mysterious object could be something else, and that, as mentioned, it may be a piece of alien tech, and that it made its way into our solar system. Those who heard the professor putting forward this theory gave him props saying that it's not very often that someone in this field has an open mind and puts forward these kinds of theories, and saying that when it happens they should be told that it's appreciated. So what do you make of these interesting photos? The sea is a treacherous place abundant with unruly dangerous waters. The sky too can be an extraordinarily dangerous place to traverse. Through the years hundreds if not thousands of ships and aircraft have tragically gone missing. So today we will be taking a look at three ghost ship discoveries. Chilling discovery of the North Korean ship curiosities often wash up on the shores of Monsen, Japan. The humble fishing village lies by the sea and its townsfolk are no strangers to the rage of winter storms. Chinese garbage floating into their waters from abroad and even to the bodies of nearby tragic victims that are occasionally discovered there from the cliffs of Yesino. It just so happens that every so often, ghost ships turn up on Monson's shores. One fateful November morning, an elderly 71-year-old man, once a fisherman, got a call from the town's coast guard. 
There was an alleged black mass in the water resembling a boat of sorts. Kakutani, the elderly man in question, said, When I saw the boat, I immediately knew that it was from North Korea. Kakutani had seen North Korean vessels before. The ship was formed of wood, only reached about 30 feet in length, and its hull was drenched in tar. A pair of legs were found when the men were pulling the boat to port, sticking out from beneath the ship, floating with the waves as if part of the ship itself. They went on to discover an additional two boats, inside of which housed the bodies of ten people. North Korean boats and ships are commonly found on the small shore villages of Japan. Every single year at least a dozen North Korean ships wash up on the beaches and harbors. The majority of these ships arrived devoid of any life, and completely empty. Sometimes, though, bodies of crews are discovered within the chambers of these boats and ships, which only increases the fear of the unknown. Within the past year, over 14 such mysterious ghost ships have been discovered on Japanese shores. With a body count higher than 30, all the bodies found were already decomposed, with the rotting process being sped up due to them being damp. These discoveries never fail to confuse Japanese investigators, who have no way of properly knowing why these body-filled ships are floating onto their beaches and what could have possibly happened to them. The ships are confirmed to be definitely North Korean, with Korean People's Army written on the hulls and the North Korean flag hanging from one of the ship's poles. Every single body found appeared to be male, though there is no way of being certain as the remains were badly decomposed. The bodies are always dressed in civilian clothing, not in the uniform crew members would wear. Autopsies revealed scarce information and the cause of death is always uncertain. The most common theory seems to be that these are the victims of defection. Those who tried to escape North Korea's ruthless regime only to be taken out and sent away in these boats. But a Japanese expert in North Korea's studies, Satoru Miyamoto, claims that he believes these are the bodies of fishermen probably from the North Korean commercial branch. Miyamoto believes that these fishermen have no military or naval knowledge and most likely got lost at sea, eventually succumbing to the elements. Extreme weather is not uncommon for this area, with other experts saying that they may have starved due to underestimating the region. High Aim 6 The High Aim 6 was a fishing ship that set course from the South Taiwanese port of Liosio in October of 2002. When it was seen again on Australian waters in 2003, it was found abandoned without a single crew member or body in sight. Tsai Huang Shu, the ship's official owner, had the last communication with the ship's captain in late December of 2002. The Taiwanese ship flew under an Indonesian flag. One of the only traceable surviving crew members from Indonesia admitted that Chen Tai Chong, the high AIM SIXS captain, had his life taken from him alongside the ship's primary engineer Ling Chengli. But the details remain murky and unsolved, with no real motive or culprit established. The high AIM-6 was discovered floating on stable, gentle waters about 92 miles from the Rolly Shoals of Australia, devoid of any signs of its previous crew members, and initially there was no clear explanation for the crew's abandonment of the ship nor for their disappearances. In fact, not a single sign of distress of any kind was detected in the initial search of the ship. Everything remained in pristine condition, including the sailors' personal belongings, being neatly tucked away without any sign of a panic or fuel and provisions were plentiful and the High Aim 6 had adequate long-line fishing equipment on board. Further investigations revealed that the High Aim SIXS engine was not working and that the rudder was broken. The Taiwanese police believed that mutiny led to the ship's abandonment. The Indonesian police managed to track down one of ten Indonesian men hired as crew members on the High Aim 6 who revealed the captain's life was taken from him along with the engineer on December 8, 2002 and so proceeded to escape home to Indonesia but refused to reveal motives or further statements around the alleged happenings. Similar events have occurred in the past with Indonesian crew members, Captains and engineers being taken of Taiwanese ships such as the Harishing 6 the previous year. The mystery of the seabird ship The Mythical Seabird was a ghost ship found near the Newport Harbor of Rhode Island in the year 1750. Those who spotted the ship went to investigate it after the ship beached itself on Easton's Beach, 
but there wasn't any sign of life. The cargo remained and, according to legend, there was a kettle boiling on the stove in the ship's kitchens with a breakfast set out on the table, untouched. Not a single thing had seemingly gone wrong. Was no trace of sickness, robbery, seat kidnapping or violence. The belongings of the sailors were still on the seabird and there was no sign of any rush or conflict, though one long boat was found missing, which suggested that the crew abandoned the ship in a fit of sudden panic. Folklore dictates that the captain was seen on the seabird's deck by nearby sailors, seemingly calm and steady mere hours prior to the ship's mysterious discovery. No one had any clue about what might have happened and why the crew took the lifeboat and fled, though it's not known if that happened. As with all ghost ship theories, mutiny is always considered. The legend goes on to say that after the seabird's cargo was taken off the ship by those who found it, the seabird itself faded into obscurity. That what had actually happened is that the seabird was sold to a merchant who proceeded to change the seabird's name, most likely to cleanse the ship's unsolved tragedy and to give it a new slate from being recognized as the ghost ship. This was in fear that no one would purchase a cursed ship. Regardless, neither the crew itself nor the seabird were ever seen again. It's as if they faded into the morning mist. Local claims of apparitions and ghosts continued, however, and the folklore ensured the legend would live on generations down the line. In fact, it actually went on to inspire authors and works of fiction, with a story being published in a Boston newspaper in 1885, allegedly being inspired by the legend of the seabird. The story was based around mutiny. In the past, ghostly tales and claims of unsolved mysteries were far more abundant and, in many ways, far more whimsical than they are today. We have got logic and science to prove against mythical beliefs of apparitions, but one cannot help but wonder whether there is truth in those claims. After all, myths of ghosts and spirits have spread all over the world for as long as humans have existed. Nowadays, we can explain some of these ghost chips using theories and logic, yet there's still some that remain a mystery. But what do you make of these three stories? When you think of Yellowstone National Park, what usually comes to mind is incredible views, a massive supervolcano that would end civilization as we know it, and the incredible wildlife that can be found throughout the area. The fact is though these scenic locations are actually some of the most hostile on our planet and every year inexperienced hikers wander into these locations never to be seen again, leaving family members and officials wondering what happened to them. This isn't always the case though, and even those that have mastered the outdoors sometimes underestimate what they're getting themselves into. Officials have said a man has passed away after encountering a grizzly bear, and this happened just outside of Yellowstone National Park. The county sheriff's office said that when they arrived in the scene, there was a moose carcass, and they theorized that the bear may have been protecting it, which caused it to attack. Charles Mock was an experienced guide, and was praised by many as being a good outdoorsman. Mr. Mock had various injuries across his face and body, and was unfortunately found by a search party 50 minutes after the ordeal. After he was found, he was quickly taken to the nearby hospital. The encounter happened when Mr. Hawk was fishing close to the Madison River, with officials saying that he came prepared and was even carrying bear spray, but they were unable to verify how much of it he used. County Sheriff's Office spokesperson Christine Kuzmin said the following. He lived in the Park Gateway community of West Yellowstone and had been in the same area fishing for almost a week. End quote. It was noted that he was fishing around 40 meters from the moose carcass. Morgan Jacobson, the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Park spokesperson said the following. He was the only one who was there, and we were never able to talk to him. Only a day later, a group of workers went out to the site to investigate what happened, and they said that a 420-pound grizzly bear tried to attack, although it was quickly taken out by one of the workers. It's reported that this is the same grizzly, and some even suggested that it may have been waiting because it knew that humans visited the area. The police said the following. Now is the time to remember to be conscientious in the backcountry, as the bears are coming out of hibernation and looking for food sources. Bear attacks, although scary, are very unlikely to happen. Wildlife experts have said there's around 40 bear attacks around the world every year 
and most of the individuals involved in these cases survive the ordeal. Most of these encounters happen by accident, and bears will actively try to avoid humans. To put it into perspective, it's estimated that dogs take out more humans than bears do. Another thing that officials have said they need to look out for within Yellowstone is that of human behavior. They said that in recent years people are putting themselves in harm's way, noting that one instance was when an individual tries to take a photograph of a bison, only for the animal to charge at the person and then launch them into the air. One of the most recent ones has angered many people. Three tourists have been charged in sentence for boiling three chickens in a hot spring. Morgan Wathen, a Yellowstone spokesperson, said the following. Two Idahoans and a Utah man had two cooking pots in a remote part of the park where they dipped a pair of whole raw chickens into one of the geyser basins. End quote. When the men stood in front of the judge, one of them said their intention was only to make dinner. As you can imagine, this didn't go down well with the judge, and all of the men who were aged in their 40s and 50s were given harsh sentences. All of them received fines that were over $1,000. They also spent a few days in jail and have been banned from entering Yellowstone National Park. Park officials have said that this type of behavior is not uncommon. And each year various people are jailed due to looting and hurting the park's wildlife. Those working at the park have said they've seen people wash their clothes in the hot springs and have even had people throw money into them, treating them as a sort of wishing well. One official said the following though, I wish people wouldn't do this as such thoughtlessness actions can actually have long-term effects. For example, doing this can cause problems with vets. The National Park statistics have said that this year's violations have tripled, meaning that over 120 arrests have been made, which resulted in many of these individuals being banned from the National Park. This happened back in 2020, and they said that this year has been better due to what happened, although people have still been making violations. Although trying to cook chickens in a thermal spring may not sound like a big deal, officials have said it could have been a lot worse. They said that what many people don't understand is that the crust above the water is extremely thin, and there have been accounts of people falling into hot springs. In fact, this recently happened to one woman. After the woman fell, the national park was closed to visitors, and park officials have said she was there illegally. When she fell into the hot springs, she suffered various wounds. At the time, the National Park had been shut down from visitors since the 24th of March, going on to say that she shouldn't have been there. The woman in question ignored the warnings and was found walking on the warming side of the park. At the time, she had not been identified, but she could be seen taking photographs close to Old Faithful. Despite falling in and injuring herself, the woman was able to pull herself out and drive around 50 miles. She was, however, stopped by a park ranger and airlifted to a burn center in eastern Idaho. Park officials have said that even though it's bad she was injured, she may face penalties for not following the rules. They said that everyone else has been doing a good job at staying away from the national park. Surveillance footage has also been released of an individual walking two dogs, and it's been suggested that this person then fell into a thermal spring. So what do you make of these recent announcements? Siberia is a place of pure intrigue, but is far too often overshadowed. Siberia lies in the midst of Russia, primarily in the northern Asian geolocation of the country. Despite accounting for 77% of the total landmass of Russia, only 23% of the Russian population inhabits Siberia. Because it is such an ancient land, it hides countless archaeological mysteries beneath its vast soil. So today, we'll be taking a look at three incredible Siberian discoveries. Female Amazon warrior buried 2,500 years ago in the Altai Mountains was male. Siberia is the place of archaeological dreams with an abundance of discoveries made constantly. Yet brand new DNA research shows that one of the most famous human remains uncovered on Siberian soil thought for ages to have belonged to a female warrior is actually a male skeleton. Initially, both archaeologists as well as anthropologists thought the corpse to have been a girl, a teenage girl with pigtails. They wholeheartedly believed her to be one of the elite warriors of the long-gone Pazeric culture. 
The Pazeric culture has been compared to the infamous Amazons from ancient Hellenic legends. As the two cultures had an immense amount in common from historical and mythological sources available to us, the remains of the warrior were examined by a Swiss expert in taxidermy named Marcel Niffenor, who managed to reconstruct what their face might have looked like when they were alive using the facial bones, only to realize the skeletal recreation had seemingly masculine features. The remains were buried beside the tomb of an older male. Archaeologists assumed that the tomb might have been father and daughter buried side by side. The older man's corpse was buried with battle axes, bows and arrowheads, whereas the warrior seemed to have been an archer and horse rider. But that was not all the warrior was buried with. Alongside war implements, there were cowrie shells, a rarity in Pazeric burials. But this implied the body was that of a young woman as the shells were thought to represent female fertility. Other things in the burial mound included a wooden sort of pillow, quivers, and even nine horse remains that were found accompanying the corpse meant to serve in the underworld. Now that the way archaeology is being tested, especially when it comes to DNA analysis, the tests showed that the body is not female as initially believed but rather that of a biological man. This research was led by the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography from the Russian Academy of Sciences combined with the Novosibirsk State University. It appears upon further research that the older man was not a father but more like an uncle. The elusive warrior's cause of death has yet to be determined. Further analysis is planned on being conducted on the remains and of the circumstances surrounding the burial in the hopes of uncovering more about the individual lives of these long-gone people, as well as to discover more about the Puseric culture. Warrior's 3,900-year-old suit of bone armor unearthed in Omsk. An extraordinary discovery was made in Omsk when archaeologists unearthed a full set of bone armor in near pristine condition. Bone armor in the past was viewed as something worn by elite warriors who proved their worth in battle. It was incredibly sturdy and strong compared to the contemporary alternatives for the era it was worn in. Experts phrased it as, it was more precious than life, because it saved life. The armor was not buried alongside the warrior who adorned it, and it is the only current battle dress found in or around Omsk. This armor did not belong to the Paziric culture. It was likely used as the Samus Semenskaya culture or Krotov culture that resided in the western forested areas of Siberia. This armor may have also been used as an exchange between cultures, warriors, or tribal leaders, gifted to someone or even may have been a spoil of war as was common during those times. It is unique first of all because such armor was highly valued, it saved life. Secondly, it was found in a settlement and this has never happened before. There were found separate fragments in burials, like on Rostovka burial ground, said Boris Konikov an archaeologist curator. At this time researchers are still uncertain about what animal or animals the bones belong to. The bone armor was discovered deep within the ground measuring down to 1.5 meters below the earth. A restoration is being performed on the armor set in hopes of restoring it to its former glory, so that it may last us for many more centuries to come. Boris Konikov has admitted that he and every other archaeologist involved was excited for the project. We ourselves cannot wait to see it, but at the moment it is undergoing restoration which is a long, painstaking process. As a result, we hope to reconstruct an exact copy. Yuri Gerasimov, another researcher from the university's Institute of Archaeology said that though there is no outward evidence to suggest the place where the bone armor was found was a place of worship, that is his theory, saying the following, while there is no indication that the place of discovery of the armor was a place of worship, it is very likely. Armor had great material value. There was no sense to dig it in the ground or hide it for a long time, because the fixings and the bones would be ruined. Such armor needs constant care. At the moment we can only fantasize, who dug it into the ground and for what purpose? Was it for some ritual or sacrifice we do not know yet? The bone plates were slightly damaged and shattered, but that is to be expected with something so painstakingly ancient and awe-inspiring. Restoration efforts are being made to clean these fragmented pieces of bone, photograph and sketch them with their location, and fix them together into a full, perfect plate. 
scientists, historians, and archaeologists agree that the person to whom the armor belonged had surely been a hero of sorts, either a renowned warrior of his civilization or someone proficient in protecting others and was so beloved that the armor was gifted to him. The site itself is home to countless other wondrous findings, primarily from the early with an abundance of weaponry, bone and stone arrowheads, spears tipped with bronze, bronze axes and bronze knives. This area seemed to have been significantly populated during the Bronze Age. The excavation site lies beside the Erdish River, whose owner is the Popovomsk Radio Factory. This factory, however, passionately supports further archaeological research and encourages more findings. Our goal is to save the site, to research it, and to promote it. 3,000-year-old brain surgery Siberia. At the burial ground at Anshevsky Archaeological Site, Southeast of Kansk in the Krasnoyarsk region, archaeologists unearthed the skeletal remains of a male who seemed to have had brain surgery. The patient was between 30 and 40 years old at the time of death and the markings on his skull, archaeologists claim, are not those of spiritual practices, but an attempt at surgical intercession. Furthermore, it is vastly believed by scientists involved that there is proof that the patient not only survived the surgery but lived for a while afterwards. The skeleton skull had a partial bone opening on the left side of the head with signs of bone healing. There were also traces of what experts believe to be an inflammatory reaction on the plates of the skull bones, further proving the theory that the patient did not only survive but lived for at least a portion of time after the operation. This had to be the case in order for the wound to begin to adequately heal, though it's thought that he died of long-term inflammation inherently caused by the surgery. The culture of the male subject is unknown, but it is thought that the unknown culture may have been similar to the Karasuk culture. In the Bronze Age, an early form of surgery did occur. From what we know, it involved having the patient enter an altered state of mind, so the pain would not be focused upon. Various herbs and plants would be used as painkillers in antiquity, and the usage of psychedelics in ancient cultures is not unheard of though hemp is what scientists believed was used by the people of this region. Surgery was likely somewhat ceremonial if only to distract the patient from the upcoming agony they would otherwise suffer through, and would have involved the usage of dancing, drum music, and consumptions of psychedelics or flora meant to ease the pain. The team working on the archaeology cases claims that the surgeon made an incision and an assistant would have helped them by stretching out the skin at the wound's edges to open up the area for medical instruments to enter it with ease. A similar skull dissection was talked about in the books written by Hippocrates in ancient Greece, which were written and performed about six centuries after this surgery. As such, it was a practice indeed performed in ancient cultures. We cannot definitively state that this operation was carried out with a specialized instrument. Nevertheless, some sort of medical instruments existed in Siberia and were widely used for post-mortem manipulations. These same instruments may have been applied for trepanation, said Dr. Slepchenko, a researcher involved in the discovery. He suggests a scraper was used and not a knife. We may only imagine the wonders lying beneath the Siberian soil. The future of archaeological findings is bright and full of the utmost potential. But what do you make of these three interesting discoveries that Siberia has uncovered? Freedom of Information Act was sent to the North Wales police and asked for details about mysterious creatures, dogmen and other strange canine creatures that may have been encountered within the area. Although this seems like a strange request and one that likely wouldn't reveal anything, it turns out the North Wales police admits there's been over 10 reports of dogmen encounters in which the police have gone on to investigate. The dogman cryptid is more commonly known in the United States, where the majority of encounters happen. However, in recent years residents in the United Kingdom have come forward with their encounters, stating that large humanoid creatures have been seen throughout the area, and noting that they seem to look like a giant wolf have the ability to walk on two legs, are extremely fast, can jump high and are very elusive. These encounters, of course, on crittered researchers to suggest that the dogman isn't just seen in the United States, but rather all across the world. Interestingly, when you start to research the topic, various different accounts and legends tell of these wolf-like creatures. The police said they had investigated upright walking canine creatures, werewolves, and dogmen, 
but said they didn't find anything in their reports, and these incidents shouldn't be taken seriously. The document states that these investigations came under large canine and wolf reports, upright canine reports, bipedal canine reports, werewolf reports, dogman reports, and hyena-like canine reports. Residents in the area have been reporting these dogman-like creatures for some time now, and although the police only released this information due to a Freedom of Information Act, it just shows that people are worried about these things and are reporting them to the police. One person described the creature as looking like a large wolf and said that she encountered it while she was driving home. Although she didn't give a specific region, she said the encounter happened somewhere in Wales and that she has no idea what it was. Going on to say this thing was easily over six feet in length and that it was completely covered in hair. Researchers who have looked into these accounts have said that dogman sightings have also been reported in England. These go back to the 1600s. A researcher said that one eyewitness saw a dogman back in 1995, saying that a security guard was working a night shift and reported seeing a large werewolf-like creature running around. Investigators were called in to check out the area but only found a caravan park, although they did note that a tree had scratches on it around seven feet up. Locals also reported seeing the creature, saying that it was large, hairy, and had glowing red eyes. This isn't the only place where dogman creatures have been encountered. Another place is that of Pakistan. Two watchmen reported seeing a mysterious creature they couldn't explain. The reports have come from Pakistan, and the men said it's happening around flea markets. The descriptions have been vague with one eyewitness saying the creature was black and had red glowing eyes, saying that before encountering it, they had a strange sensation. Other locals in the region said that others were coming forward with reports of strange dog-like creatures. Another eyewitness gave a better description and said the creature they saw was a black dog, was able to walk on two legs, let out a loud howl, and once again had glowing red eyes. Black dogs with red eyes are not anything new. The black dog is said to be a nocturnal ghost and in some cases a shapeshifter. It's usually associated with the devil and is described as a hellhound or a ghost. The general physical features of a black dog or a ghost dog resemble that of a normal dog. However, it's much bigger in size and has glowing eyes. One of the stranger reports surrounding that of the dogman comes from New York. According to the report, a woman had arrived home a few minutes after dusk while her two children aged 2 and 11 were sitting in the vaccines. The woman reported that as soon as she stepped out her car, she had a sixth sense that something was watching her. She also said there was no noise coming from any crickets or people nearby. This led her to quickly grab the kids and start rushing them into their house. As she approached the front door, she claimed to hear a loud growl that was described as being deep-turning similar to that of an angry dog. Before anything else could happen, the woman got herself and her two kids in their house and closed and locked the door quickly behind her. It wasn't long before she called the husband to come home quickly because a large animal was outside. When the husband came home, it was discovered by this point in time that the family cat had gone missing, and so the husband went looking around nearby to see if perhaps it was bears or a large wild dog. After a moment of searching, the husband also began to notice a strange silence, only to spot a strange large humanoid animal running through the forest nearby the house. This led to him to take aim at the creature, but it was running too fast and was able to get away. This led to the couple to reporting the encounter as a dogman encounter, as any other explanation was impossible to explain. Unfortunately, their cat was never found. As of today, what these creatures are is still up for debate. Skeptics have said the majority of reports happen during the night, and this can cause people to misidentify everyday animals. However, there aren't any animals in the United Kingdom that match the shape and size of these creatures. Encounters with the dogman are still being reported. So what do you make of these interesting stories? When the United States Space Force was announced, it caught many people's attention, with some not quite understanding why the United States needs a space force. Regardless, the whole idea is very much real, and it got many people talking. For those unaware, Space Force made headlines after it was announced on the 20th of December 2019, 
although there were talks about it before this. President Donald Trump said the plans were being put into place to begin a space force. This military service would be operating in space and everything that revolves around space. This is the first of its kind and it's got many people asking questions. One being why do we need a space force? If there is no threat beyond our planet, why is this necessary? According to researchers, there's no evidence that extraterrestrial life exists. So for some this does seem like a strange move. Some theorize though that President Trump may have inside knowledge, and this was the reason behind getting Space Force established. Trump claimed that at the time he had inside knowledge of unidentified flying objects, and even said that he may release inside information to the world. This was only backed up when Chaim Esht, a former Israeli space security chief, said that the United States and Israeli governments have been in contact with a Galactic Federation of Aliens, and that President Trump was actually on the verge of releasing this information to the public, going on to say that he thought the public deserved to know the truth about what was going on. According to Eshe, though, the reason President Trump didn't release this information was because he was in talks with this federation, and they said that with how things are going he should hold back on telling the truth. Insiders have now said that Trump could release this information. Esht isn't just some random person either. He served as the chief of the Israeli space security program for almost 30 years. He went on to say that the Galactic Federation and top officials from our planet have met and have agreements on researching and learning about the fabric of the universe. President Trump has said in previous interviews that he has and that he will release it when he feels he needs to. This is exciting as many presidents have been against talking about UFOs. But now with the recent shift in views, it seems that Trump could be the one to announce it to the world. Esh had said that because of how respected he is in his field, his words should be taken seriously. He went on to say the following, if I'd come up with what I'm saying five years ago, I would have been hospitalized. Today they're already talking differently. I have nothing to lose. I've received my degrees and awards. I am respected in universities abroad where the trend is also changing. It's interesting how many officials have come forward in the last few years to talk about unidentified flying objects and the fact that government officials have known about them for several years. This has caused some here on the fence about this topic to start taking it more seriously. It was only a few months back when we were told that higher officials and the Pentagon had recovered off-world graphs. With all of the recent issues plaguing the United States, you can imagine why senators would be on the edge during any briefs on issues of national security that requires immediate attention, as well as the seriousness associated with such meetings. However, nothing could have prepared them for this strange national security debriefing featuring senators from all across the country. They alerted them that the United States Defense Department claims to have captured a craft not from this world. According to Eric Davis, the astrophysicist claims the United States Department of Defense is in possession of or recovered off-world craft that is verifiably not made on our planet. His story detailed to the New York Times claims that Davis was tasked with giving classified briefings to Defense Department agencies, the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. During multiple instances of recovered materials from extraterrestrial events, Davis details that he was unable to determine the source of the materials, most likely being off-world metals and materials that could not have occurred in nature. Even Navy officials and pilots have said they were seeing these mysterious crafts on our daily vases and that they were told by hype officials not to talk about what they'd seen. But some of these pilots have come forward in detail that these mysterious objects do not belong to us and that they were shown behavior that none of our tech can replicate. It's interesting how many officials in the last few years have come forward to talk about unidentified flying objects, and the fact that government officials have known about them for several decades. This has caused some to ask for disclosure around unidentified flying objects. You have people talking about this topic that before would have distanced themselves from it. White House officials declined to comment on the Galactic Federation, while NASA said the following, Although we've yet to find signs of extraterrestrial life, NASA is exploring the solar system and beyond to help us answer fundamental questions, including whether we are alone in the universe. Esh had said at this point in his career he has nothing to lose, 
and that people deserve to know the truth about what's going on. Interestingly, it was also announced that when the president signed the $2.3 trillion relief and government funding bill back in December, it also started the ball rolling on something else. As of that date, U.S. intelligence agencies have just 180 days to release everything they know about UFOs. President Trump's former intelligence director, John Ratcliffe, said that there's many unexplainable UFO sightings and that many of them can't be explained. The bill says that officials must release what they know about the unidentified aerial phenomena and that Ratcliffe said the public has no idea about how many unidentified UFO sightings there are saying that the public is kept in the dark about this kind of stuff. So what do you make of the claims that our governments are in contact with aliens? And what do you make of the idea of there being a galactic federation? Or so do you think that President Trump will release the truth about what's going on? Space has fascinated us for years. New, interesting discoveries are constantly being made, not just showing us how small we are, but giving us an insight into the wonders of our universe. It's likely that within many of our lifetimes we'll see humans on the red planet, as these missions are going to happen within the next 10 years. Jim Bridenstine said the following about the upcoming mission. We are working right now. Put together a comprehensive plan on how we could conduct a Mars mission using the technologies that we will be proving at the moon. Unfortunately, despite these new claims, and this new rush to beat the SpaceX's Mars colonization developments, a report has surfaced from the Science and Technology Policy Institute that detailed information improved to be provided to the United States Congress that supported the conclusion that NASA does not have the technology and infrastructure to sustain or craft a Mars mission whatsoever by the year 2033. The report also assumed that even if the NASA budget was treated as an unlimited resource, the time constraints in the project specifications would be impossible to meet, with NASA's current employee numbers, work output, and overall technological advancements. The report detailed the following. We find that even without budget constraints, a Mars 2033 orbital mission cannot be realistically scheduled under NASA's current initial plan, end quote. Despite this report and additional supporting claims by other corporate space agencies criticizing NASA's developments, the organization still feels capable of supporting a 2033 Mars mission and says it will use a number of Martian rovers to gather complex information on water gathering techniques and soil samples on the Red Planet to decide what course of action will be best for human colonization. Recently, NASA captured an interesting object close to our sun. In recent years, this object has become known as the cube in theories for what it is ranges from an unidentified flying object to camera anomalies. NASA have pointed out that these objects are nothing of interest, have nothing to do with unidentified flying objects, and have said there's no need for further explanation, as what we are looking at is something like a glitch in the data. However, not everyone agrees with this idea. In fact, another one of these cubes has just showed up at the sun, and right away UFO believers started to share the image. The image shows what looks like a giant cube close to the surface of the sun, with some saying it looks like solar rays are causing the object to look a little faded. And as mentioned on NASA's website, the joint NASA-ESA Solene Heliospheric Observatory mission, SOHO was designed to study the sun inside out, from its internal structure, to the extensive outer atmosphere, to the solar wind that blows across the solar system. Launched in December 1995, SOHO was meant to operate until 1998, but it's been so successful that ESA and NASA have endorsed several mission extensions over the past two decades, allowing it to cover multiple solar circles. As believers pointed out though, these mysterious cubes keep making appearance close to the sun, with one researcher saying that in one of these images it looks like the cube is interacting with the sun. One user who saw the image said the following this image looks strange because it appears it's been blacked out we've seen this time and time again on places like Google Earth but now it appears to be happening in space something is clearly pulling away from the sun and even having an effect on it I'd love to see what's behind it it's strange that they felt the need to black out whatever was there in most of these images the cube is by the side of the sun but this is one of those times where it actually appears to be having an effect on the sun. Others went on to share more images of these mysterious cubes, pointing out that others appear to be embedded inside the sun, or even interacting with it. As of right now, 
UFO researchers have said they think these crafts are not from this world. Could even be monitoring our planet and watching human civilization. Interestingly, those who have studied these anomalies have said this two different times. You have this one that looks kind of transparent and cloaked, then the other version that looks like a giant black cube. UFO researchers have said the large transparent cube has a kind of cloak on them, that means it's harder to see them, whereas the black cubes aren't actually a cube, but were actually placed there in order to hide something behind it. Those who have used measuring tools have suggested these giant cubes are hundreds of miles in length. Sky watchers go on to say it's not just the sun where these large objects are seen, but they've also appeared close to our moon as well. As mentioned, amateur researchers who have measured it have said it's massive. But what do scientists make of these anomalies? Firstly, they've said that what people are seeing is definitely not an extraterrestrial ship and that sometimes space debris can take on different shames that makes it look like something is not. NASA and other space agencies have said they presented evidence to back this up and note that although they look impressive, when NASA scientists have looked at them, they've always turned out to have a mundane explanation. According to one scientist, they noted that many of these images show these anomalies, and all that people are seeing is glitches in the software, and that it has nothing to do with UFOs. NASA backed this up and said that out of the hundreds of thousands of photographs they've taken, they've never once captured an unidentified flying object. Ferva saying that another thing that could explain what people are seeing is that of space debris, and when this flies in front of the camera as it gives off the illusion that something is there when it isn't. So what do you make of these photographs? Do you think something is there? Or is this just a software glitch? Over the past five years, a worrying number of U.S. officials, diplomats, Soldiers and intelligence officers have come down with a mysterious illness. All of the U.S. diplomats documented the same symptoms, which ranged from memory loss, loss of hearing, headaches, loss of balance, fatigue, and ringing in the ears. The mysterious illness has affected some more than others, with some officials even going on to suffer long-term brain damage. It's gotten to the point that the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence Agency has got involved saying that it looks like these officials are being singled out and attacked. An investigation by the State Department said that likely causes that of a direct energy weapon. Some of these attacks happened in places that don't have the best security, but the Central Intelligence Agency has said the two incidents have occurred near the White House. One of the most recent reports happened on the 17th of May 2021. What's worrying is that the United States' best intelligence have no idea who's controlling this direct energy weapon, what they're doing with it, and where it's coming from. The Pentagon has now said they plan to create a sensor that can be worn by U.S. diplomats, and this will help identify where the attacks are coming from. One of the main questions is who is operating these direct energy weapons. A recent study showed U.S. intelligence that over 150 people have reported being attacked by these energy weapons with them pretty much having all the same symptoms. The incident soon got the name of Havana Syndrome, and this is because it first appeared in Havana, which is in Cuba, and this happened back in 2016. The State's Department soon received complaints from over 21 employees of the U.S. Embassy, or reporting that they had come down with the same symptoms, including memory problems, loss of balance, loss of hearing fatigue, and ringing in the ears. At first, officials didn't take the report seriously, and this caused some to make complaints to their central intelligence agency, asking them to investigate the cause further. U.S. officials then looked to Cuba and asked if they had any involvement with the mysterious, but they denied these claims. However, U.S. diplomats who have traveled to places like China and Russia have also reported the same symptoms, causing U.S. security to think that these countries may be involved. A former senior central intelligence officer, Mark Polymeropoulos, suddenly came down ear-wobbing in Moscow back in 2017. He said the following, I was woken up in the middle of the night my head was spinning. Incredible nausea. I felt like I had to go to the bathroom and throw up. It was just a terrifying moment for me. I had tinnitus which was ringing in my ears, and the vertigo really was what was incredibly debilitating, and I really wasn't sure what was happening. I couldn't stand up. I was falling over. Rather worryingly, he went on to say that to this day he still has these symptoms. 
saying that it's been years now and that it's so bad that you had to retire from the Central Intelligence Agency because of this mysterious illness. He carried on with the following, I had a lot more to offer. I was 50 but I had to retire because of these headaches. They don't go away. End quote. This study also showed that other U.S. officials have complained of similar instances. And some of these officials were even pulled from countries like China because they could no longer work. The attacks are still being reported, with the White House workers saying that they were buzzed and have now fallen ill. It's gotten so bad that Congress has now said this is a national security threat and that something needs to be done in order to protect U.S. officials. Security personnel then turn to the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in the hopes that they will be able to get to the bottom of what's going on. They had an answer. They said the directed pulsed radio frequency energy was behind the attacks. According to a New York Times analysis who looked into the accounts and what has been happening over the past few years, they said that the language is very interesting and that using words like pulsed and directed shows this isn't being caused by random energy from things like cell phones or other devices, and shows that this is a direct energy weapon being used to attack people, and it's showing that whoever is using this is clearly working. Some of these reports were leaked from the Central Intelligence Agency, and as of right now Congress have been careful with their wording. Senator Susie Collins said the following, There's a mysterious direct energy weapon that's being used, and it's causing in some cases permanent traumatic brain injury. End quote. As of right now, U.S. officials are trying to track down who's responsible for these attacks. And the going idea as of right now is that Russian officials are behind what's going on. Although, as expected, they've denied having any involvement. Various declassified documents have shown us that the U.S. and Russia have attacked each other in some way or another. Whether being physical through things like cybercrime, President Biden has said that President Trump didn't take these seriously and that he will be the one to get to the bottom of his reports. He said that he looked to the Central Intelligence Agency and they've told him that they will get to the bottom of whoever is doing this. CIA Director William Burns said these attacks were of high priority. One of the countries that has made good advancements in direct energy weapons is that of China with officials releasing videos and images of their latest tech. The power of these lasers is impressive, with them saying that they can cause injury to humans and that they can easily knock things like drones out of the sky. One Chinese official said these weapons are being used on things like the borders and said that these direct energy weapons can take effect within seconds. Although it's important to note that Chinese officials have said it's not them attacking U.S. diplomats. So what do you make of these direct energy weapons? Who do you think is behind them? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comments section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.